Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. <clears throat> so for announcements, check out Canvas. There is a homework assignment that is due this Friday. So take a look at that. Um, if you have any questions, stop by office hours. I'd be happy to chat right after class. For lab this week, you will be finishing up your measurements from lab one. So lab one was a two week lab just to get us started. Uh, also folks requested uh, locker lockers to be assigned. And so if there's enough lock lockers in the ITLL this Friday, we're gonna get lockers assigned. So please uh, attend lab this Friday to finish up the measurements and to get a locker if you would like one. Okay, if you have any questions during class, just shout out your question, unmute, shout out your question. Otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise low um, or shoot me a chat. And if I see it, I will answer your question. And if not, if I don't see it for a while, uh, shout out your question. All right, uh, so let's jump back into the material here. So <clears throat> last time we ended with calculating energy delivered to a load and that came out of our Ohm's law discussion. So what I wanted to do this time is, is continue along that path and discuss an issue that affects mechanical engineers since many of you or all of you are mechanical engineers. Oftentimes in my engineering job, it's the mechanical engineer who is responsible for cable harnesses, connectors, wiring, cable runs. Um, you know, the electrical engineer has to specify a lot of that and the, the, the ICD, the, the interface. Uh, but mechanical engineers are responsible for, well, a mechanical part, including the weight and the, the, the size of the cable runs. So it's really split responsibilities, but mechanical engineers often do the drawings and, um, and, and do that design and take that on. So I wanted to talk a little bit about wire resistance and wire gauge and some issues you might face uh, with interconnects between subsystems and electronic system. Okay, so wires are non ideal conductors uh, with non-zero resistance, unlike what we said uh, during your intro circuits class, right? So wire resistance actually causes a voltage drop between wire ends, okay? So there's a voltage drop, there's current flowing through that wire. That means there can be significant power dissipation. That power is dissipated in the form of heat. The wire gets hot, right? And so, uh, also at the ends of the wires, the, the connections, the junctions can cause a voltage drop and power dissipation due to resistance. That resistance can be caused by poor solder joints, can be caused by the breadboard connections. And in fact, I think you're gonna see this in your project. Um, uh, over time, the, the breadboard, uh, the, the, the terminals inside, the metal inside and the material, that the, uh, the ends of the jumper wires are made of. They're different material. They start to corrode a little bit. So if you might notice uh, some certain things that I'll talk about when, when we get to that part of the lab. But this is these are all real effects, right? Wire splices cause voltage drops. Uh, corroded terminals cause uh, voltage drops. I'm sure you've had a battery not start, right? Not start your car because well, you open up the hood and there's all this green blue stuff around one of the terminals and you clean it and the car starts fine. That's a high resistance condition, okay? And so let's look at an example of measured wire resistance, okay? So um, for example, a jumper wire from your lab kit. So if you, uh, the jumper wire I had, I think you have the same ones was from end to end 5.75 inches, okay? And I used a high current source and Ohm's law rather than an ohmmeter to get better accuracy of this resistance of this wire because the resistance was I expected to be small over this short length of wire. So I connected a two amp source and, and I measured uh, the voltage with a voltmeter to get the, the voltage across the wire. Now that should be zero, right? From circuits class. Wires are perfect conductors, right? It should be zero. Well, it's not zero. So here are two multimeters measuring on the left is the current, on, on the right is the voltage. So you can see I have uh, two amps going through this wire under test. I have uh, and one, uh, 128 millivolts, 0.128 volts 
Okay. The way I created two amps exactly, almost exactly, uh, was with a power supply set for constant current. We'll talk about that when we get to measurement equipment. You can, you can set lab power supplies typically for a constant current. So you, you, you dial a constant current into the, the current limiting setting, turn up the voltage and you'll get a constant current. Okay, so the wire current is two amps. The voltage across the wire me measured of this real wire was uh, 128 millivolts. So the resistance is 64 milliohms, right? 0.064 ohm. <clears throat> ohms. So that's really small as expected. Okay. Um, and wire is actually specified with resistance. Usually it's given in ohms per thousand feet. And I'll show you a table that, that lists that. And so if you use this, you know, convert 5.75 inches into feet, and figure out the ohms per foot and then multiply by a thousand, you get 133.6 ohms per thousand feet. So that's how this wire would be specified. Okay. And that's much different than, well, zero, right? A real wire should have zero. Well, a theoretical wire should have zero. So, so, uh, there are some conditions, and I'll show you a couple. Um, when you have significant current through a wire, um, that small resistance can make a difference. Okay. So when you're measuring low resistance value, for example, some this wire under test, um, you get into other effects of measurements that I want to talk about, like the resistance of the test leads of the wires that go from the test equipment over to the well place I'm measuring the, the voltage. So the resistance of the test leads contributes uh, to uh, voltage drops for high current through the leads. So here are two test leads that I drew, drew as a cartoon. And I really did this measurement. I have the test leads back here. So I was curious myself what kind of resistance they had. So this is the voltage I measured on the last slide that one, 128 millivolts across that wire. But I noticed on the power supply, I see 0.46 volts. That doesn't match with 0.13 volts. Okay, so those are those are two different voltages. I confirmed with the voltmeter, another voltmeter, that I have 0.436 volts across these terminals. That's a little different than the power supply voltage because usually the voltmeters are are a little more accurate. Okay, and so. You get 0.436 at the power supply. That means there's 0.23 volts across the test leads, right? That's total. One test lead plus the other test lead voltage is 0.23 volts. That's more than the voltage I'm trying to measure over here, 128 uh, millivolts. Um, so, th so the lesson is when you're when you're measuring um, small voltages and you have high currents, where you measure voltages in a circuit matters in this case because of the wires. When you have a circuit board, right, uh, it matters because of the copper trace on the circuit board where you measure the voltage uh, if you have high current or if you have multiple circuit boards with interconnects, right, it matters where you where you measure the voltage, okay? And so, um, and I mentioned voltmeters are typically more accurate than what you see on a power supply. So, if you really need to know an accurate voltage, use a voltmeter, a multimeter set to voltage. Okay. So someone asks in the chat if uh, if I if I put a set voltage through the wire and measure current, would you still see that resistance in the wire? Why set amps instead of volts? Oh, okay. So why so why did I do this? Why did I why did I use two amps? Um. Because I knew I wanted a high current. Okay. Um. It would be hard for me to exactly set a voltage with the power supply, like like 100 and you know 0.128 volts on a power supply is really hard to tune in with 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 the power supply because usually it's like 0.1 volts is the re resolution. So if I went 0.1 volts, maybe that would be you know some a lot smaller current. It wouldn't be two amps. And if I go to 0.2 volts, that's going to be a lot more current than I want. I might. I might burn out the wire. So that's why I set constant current instead of constant voltage. 
because I knew I wanted to use, well, two amps is okay going through this thin gauge wire. I'll show you why I thought that. Um, that's why I chose to use um, the uh, constant current mode. And it, was that a chance of shorting? Well, I was shorting, right? This I, I am shorting, which is interesting. When you when you connect a wire across a power supply, or right, it's two terminals, you're you're shorting that power supply. Well, kind of, right? Because there is a finite resistance from that um, from that wire. Okay. All right. So, so let's talk about resistivity. Okay, resistivity is a way you characterize Ohm's law for a material, like like a metal wire. So resistance of a wire can be calculated, uh, and, or it can be characterized using resistivity, and resistance can be calculated using resistivity. And so that's this uh, this variable rho, okay, and it's in units of ohms, ohm meters, which is a weird unit. I never liked that unit. But it makes sense when you look at the physical configuration and what you're measuring. So if I have a wire, here's a cylindrical wire, I have current going through that length of wire, length L. It has resistivity, rho, ohm meters, and cross-sectional area, A. Then resistance is rho L over A. So L is length in meters. A is area in square meters. And if you know you ohm meters times meters over square meters, you get ohms, which is what you want for resistance. Notice how resistance is linear. It's normally linear with um, the length of the wire. So you double the wire length, you double the resistance of that wire. It's inversely proportional to the area. So if you increase the area of the cross-sectional area of the wire, you uh, reduce the resistance. So resistivity is a characteristic of a metal wire, and it depends on the material. So copper versus, for example, some wires now are copper-coated aluminum. Copper-coated aluminum um, has a different conductivity. So, so you've got to take that into account when you're calculating voltage drop. So uh, co copper-coated aluminum is off often cheaper than pure copper. So resistivity of copper is this ohm meters at 20 degrees C. So right, about room temperature, a little, little low. So here's an example. Calculate the resistance of, uh, or the resistance per thousand feet of copper wire. And that copper wire has a diameter of 80 mils, 80 thousandths or 81 thousandths, 0 0.0808. That's the diameter. I'll show you the table of, of 12 gauge wire. We'll talk about gauge. So the resistivity is this for copper. Here's the length. That's the length in meters. We have to make units consistent here. Okay, here's the wire diameter in inches, right? 80 mils or 80 thousandths. Uh, wire here's the wire diameter in meters. Here's the wire area in square meters. And so the resistance is uh, rho L over A. So um, 1.588 ohms per thousand feet. That's the resistance per thousand feet because I used a thousand feet as the length. Okay. When you see some tables, um, they'll they'll list this this parameter called circular mills. So to simplify calculations, some equations use what's called circular mills. I generally don't use it. It's always confused me. It's harder for me to work with circular mills than just with square meters. But resistance can be calculated by some constant, for example, it's 10.4 for copper, times the length in feet divided by the area in circular mills, which that circular mills um, area takes into account the ratio between a circle and a square. And so again, it's confusing to me, but I wanted to point it out in case you see circular mills somewhere. All right, so these wires, usually wires are not specified in radius or diameter, they're specified in gauge. When we say gauge in the United States, we usually mean American wire gauge or AWG. No one ever says American wire gauge. Go to Home Depot and say American wire gauge. They won't know what you're talking about. So they will know AWG. Um, so a common way to specify the diameter 
uh, and resistance of a solid is with, uh, oh, that's not right. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, okay. The common way to specify the diameter and resistance of a solid, not stranded, round, not square, electrical wire is AWG. And AWG tables, I'll show you one, they specify ohms per thousand feet at various temperatures. So for example, here is a table. So let's look at this table. Across the top, we have gauge. That's, that's the AWG, the gauge number. Then the conversion into what's the diameter in mils. Mils are thousandths, thousandths of an inch, okay? So the diameter in mils. And here's that circular mils calculation, square inches, and finally ohms per thousand feet. And you can see ohms per thousand feet depends on temperature. So here we go from zero C, 32 Fahrenheit freezing, all the way up to um, uh, 75 C, okay, 167 Fahrenheit. And here's that table. Okay, so for example, a 14 gauge wire, that's 14 AWG, and it's a copper wire, uh, and it's it's um, has a diameter of you can see where is that right here 64.08 mils. That's 0 0 .064, 0 0.064 inches. And then you can read off the the resistance in ohms per thousand feet. So at 25 C, we see 2. Point, uh, oh wait, no at at 20 C, I have the wrong number here. At 20C, we have uh, 2.525, okay? So, so that's, the, that's the resistance. And you can see how that resistance changes over temperature. So that's important, right? If you have a, a wire in a lab environment sitting in the ITLL, right? You have a big long wire with a lot of current going through it. That's different than if you have a wire under the hood of a car, right? You know, maybe you have some long wire, some, you know, six foot wire and you have 10 amps through that wire. And then temperature would then make a difference. And look how the resistance goes up from about 2.5, right, up to three. Right? If, if I do my math right, but that's about a, that's like a 20% increase in resistance. That, that could make a difference in your calculations. Okay, so temperature matters, resistance matters. Um, Resistance increases with temperature, and wires are not perfect conductors, neither are traces on circuit boards. Okay. So what about stranded wire? So stranded wire, um, here's here's uh, AWG of the gauge of stranded wire. It's determined by the, the cross-sectional area of an equivalent solid wire. So if you see 14 gauge stranded wire, and you measured it with a with the you know, calipers, you would see, well, it looks like the diameter is a little bigger. That's because there's some air air gaps in there between the, you know, as the round wires go together. And um, uh, and so 14 gauge wire still has this ohms per thousand feet because it has the same cross-sectional area of, of copper. Stranded wire is usually better for wire that moves, okay? In other words, it, it has, um, it, it's less, brittle, it won't break. Um, it's First of all, it's more flexible, but it also is less prone to breaking, especially at the joints, okay? So someone said, does AWG always imply copper wire? No, it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, so it, this this is the table for, for copper wire, okay? Which is most of the wire I work with. Again, except for that copper coated aluminum and I haven't done a measurement yet. I want to do a measurement on a good length of copper coated aluminum wire and, and prove what I just said that, oh, if it calls out 14 gauge or you know 26 gauge, then I get consistent resistance measurements. So if I get that this semester, I will, I will bring that to you. Uh, something else about wire gauge. So if you look here, you have zero and increments of one. Uh, Wires are commonly offered in even wire gauges. So if you have a 14 gauge wire, you won't find a 15 gauge wire at an electronics shop typically or at Home Depot, right? So you'll see 14, 16, 18, um, they're just offered in even gauges. Zero is the, 
the the biggest uh single digit gauge right as you go as you go as your gauge gets larger your wire gets thinner but once you get down to zero you can go double zero they call it double aught or triple aught or quadruple aught those are thicker wires for bigger gauges okay so that's wire gauge All right. Okay, so let's look at a practical application. Like you might say, so what? It's, you know, it's a quarter of an ohm or, you know, half an ohm or even two ohms. Who cares, right? Who cares about this? Well, here's an example of the impact of wire gauge. And this is a real, this is a real problem. You might run into this someday. The impact of wire gauge on, on power efficiency. Let's suppose you, you, you know, you're taking your, you're putting solar panels on your house or you're, you're taking your RV out into the woods and you have, you have a few solar panels so that you can have some, some power out in the woods. Okay. So you have this load and, and the loads, you might be running something directly off the solar panels, but usually you have uh, something called a, a, a solar um, charge controller, battery charge controller, battery hooked up. You might run some loads off that. A load is something that takes in power and, converts it into something like light, heat, motion. But maybe maybe you're running wires from your roof down to your garage where your your solar controller is. Or maybe again you 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 parked in the shade and you have you have 50 feet of wire that runs out to where the solar panels are on some on some stands. Okay. And you're trying to decide on what wire gauge you should use, right? Based on power loss and cost. And so what you're going to do is you're going to buy these panels. Each panel, each of the four panels is a 100-watt panel. We'll talk about panels later, but 100 watts at nominally 18 volts in full sun. Okay. And then you connect them all in parallel. And you say, I'm going to connect these all like I, I showed here. They're all in parallel. So 18 volts all in parallel right across these two wires that run 50 feet. Okay, so you have 18 volts at your charge controller over here. And then, uh, so four times four hundred, or four times one hundred is four hundred watts. So you have four hundred watts at eighteen volts, you can you can power, you know, something or something in your trailer or your house. Well, let's look at how much current has to go through those two wires, those fifty feet wires. So uh, P equals I V, I is equal to P over V. So you have twenty two amps, twenty two point two amps through those wires. Okay, and, and so you, you go, uh, you have your charge controller and you look at its rating, it says 100 volts. Okay, great, I can have 18 volts into my 100 volt charge controller. Okay, and you're trying to choose wire gauge. So maybe you look at wire gauge, 14 gauge wire, and it's $72 for 100 feet, right? That's an actual price, I got that online for this, this wire. And you look up, okay, the resistance per, per uh, thousand feet is 2.575 ohms for 14 gauge. The wire length is 100 feet. Uh, it's 100 feet, not 50, because the current, your, you know, you, your current goes uh, through the red wire, the return current through the black wire. So there's 100 feet of wire through which you're losing power. So the current is 22.2 amps. We said that the power loss to the wire is I squared R. Right? This is last time I said power equals I squared R use ohm's law that's 127 watts right the power from the panel is only 400 watts at at the where you join these two wires so the power loss to the wire is 32 percent so you're losing 32 percent of your power to the resistance of that wire that's a lot right um right if, if you really want 400 watts you have to increase the number of panels by 32 percent uh, that's going to cost you more money. So you say, well, what if I do 10 gauge wire? So 10 gauge wire, it's more expensive. It's almost twice the cost. So here's the resistance per length of the, the 10 gauge wire, right? Wire length, 100 feet. Resistance. Here's the resistance. Um, right, ohms per 100 foot wire. Here's the current, same current. So the power loss to the wire is only 50 watts. Well, that's better because that's only 
of your power lost. Okay, so you might do it, right? You might you might choose to spend an extra seventy dollars so that you can get you know twenty percent additional power instead of heating up the wires. You get the power delivered to your house, trailer, you know, camper, tent, whatever. But the point here is that wire gauge affects power loss and cost, right? Why don't we just do, you know, double lot wire and be done with it? Because that'd be really expensive. And so, you know, think about it. What would your decision be in this case? My decision was, well, I'd probably spend an extra $70 to get, you know, an extra, what's that, like 40 watts or something. No, power loss to wire, that's like 70 watts. And so would your decision be different or would this even be possible if you had a four kilowatt system like people put on their houses, right? You think about how much current you'd have to get down the wire. That'd be a huge loss. In fact, you probably couldn't use wire this small at 18 volts for that if you did the calculations. Okay. Um, and so weight and temperature are also factors. So if you're, you're a mechanical engineer, you're designing a, a you know, maybe a, an aircraft or a larger drone or something like that. You know, if you change from 18 gauge wire to 10 gauge wire and you have, you know, 500 feet of wire in that aircraft, you could add some, some significant weight. Okay. Okay. So someone said, uh, this is a great question. If you wired these solar panels in series, would you not be able to charge the battery? Okay. So here's, this is what this charge controller is for. This charge controller is actually a DC to DC converter. We're going to talk about that later, but you know, I would connect, mm, I probably, I wouldn't connect 18 volts with this many panels directly to a battery. You would raise, you'd raise the, uh, I'll show you, I'll, we'll talk about charging, but that would be too much power, too much current to put into a, to a battery all at once. But your point is very valid. This charge controller should handle that. This charge controller is actually taking that 18 volts and it's bringing it down to probably about 13, 13 and a half, 14 volts to charge that battery with, well, whatever that battery wants to see in terms of charging current, usually something like capacity over 10. But to answer your question, yeah, what, what, uh, what if you put these solar panels in series and what's the impact on um, power efficiency if you change the voltage by connecting uh, these panels in series. Okay, so you do this. So I have the same panel, same load, same length of wire. I connect the, uh, the solar panels in series. So I have 72 volts, okay? And so that's still 400 watts. I still have solar panels collecting 400 watts of solar energy. We'll talk about that. Um, so the current now, it's not 22 amps, it's only 5.5 amps. Okay, so now uh, you check your charge controller, it can handle 100 volts, right? You can't, you can't keep going up in voltage because the charge controller won't handle it. 100 volts is pretty common. So you look at the same calculation, your $72 wire, I'll roll down through this and do the same calculation with five amps instead of 22 amps. And I only lose 2% of the power. That's pretty good, right? That's, that's pretty good. Um, I do the same thing for 10 gauge wire. Maybe I can get that better. And I do. I lose about 1% of my power. Right? So I'm, I'm losing about 8 watts here, 3 watts here. And so now my cost trade might be different. Is it worth an extra $70, $68? to save 1% of power, probably not for me, right? You can make your own decision there. Um, you know, it costs more, it's heavier, bulkier. So, so that's a lesson, that's the takeaway here is that just choosing whether components, these solar panels were put in series or parallel is affecting your mechanical engineering life, right? In weight, in volume, um, and it's and and so uh, and also power loss, right? So if you needed to maintain the same 
power into the load, you'd have to have more solar panels. So that's even more weight and more area you have to take up. So the higher voltage for power transmission is generally more efficient because of the lower current, those I squared R losses, okay? Um, and so the system components need to be rated for the higher voltage. Right? You can't go over 100 volts for these, for, for, for this system, for this charge controller. And don't forget safety is a factor. So um, any voltage over about 50 or 60 volts uh, is considered dangerous. It's a hazard. So you could get shocked. Um, you know, you put your fingers across a 12 volt battery, you won't feel anything because there's, you know, that voltage and your body's resistance is so little current, you don't feel anything. If you touch 50 or 60 volts, you're, you're going to feel it. If you touch 120 volts, you're going to feel it. Don't do that. Okay. Um, okay. So someone says then, okay, how to decide which connection to use, then what are the practical applications of using panels in parallel? Okay. So in this case, if one of these panels gets gets hit by something, uh, the neighbor's kid's baseball, right? Or if one of the panels just goes bad, goes bad early, has a manufacturing defect, or just it went bad early in its life. If it fails open, you've just lost your whole solar array. Okay, so that would be bad. In, in parallel, that's exactly right. Someone said single point of failure. So if you put them in in parallel, and you lose one because of an open, uh, then, uh, which is how these are typically going to fail. Then, then, then you're okay, right? Because you've lost maybe 25% of your power. In series, you'll lose 100% of your power if one of these panels opens up and no current can flow through it. Um, so many systems actually use a combination of series and parallel. So if you did like a four kilowatt system, you might use. 72 volts, four in, four in series, and then stack those in parallel so you can have some, um, you know, some uh, um, fail safe there, right? Redundancy. All right, but but I'm telling you this. So this is why can I work with mechanical engineers and what I see what electrical engineers do affects mechanical engineers' lives. So I want to bring some of those out, some of those issues out in this class. All right. Um, any other questions on on this? I'm going to move on to capacitors next. But any any comments or questions on Ohm's law, resistance, or this setup here? All right. All right. Nothing heard. Nothing seen in the chat. So let's talk about capacitors. So capacitors, you've seen this in physics. If you take two conducting metal plates, put them parallel, put an insulator in between air or another dielectric, um, you get a capacitor. And so in physics and in intro circuits, we define current and voltage for a capacitor like this. Capacitance is C in farads, microfarads, picofarads, nanofarads, okay? And the relationship between current and voltage is this, I is equal to C dV dt, right? That's the derivative of voltage with respect to time. So the takeaway here, really the big takeaway is current is zero when, when the voltage is not changing, when the voltage is DC. Okay, so capacitors act as DC blocks. Okay, they block current at DC. Um, and current only flows when V of T is time varying. So a sinusoid or random noise, triangular wave, whatever you have, current flows when V of T is time varying. Actually, current doesn't flow across the insulator. It's just the capacitor charging and discharging that makes it makes it look like currents flowing through the capacitor, but the capacitor is just charging and discharging. Okay. But from a circuit's perspective, from outside the capacitor, that's the current. Um, so you could represent a capacitor as an impedance. So so when we when we work with sinusoidal steady state circuits, that just means the voltages and the currents are sinusoids, right? Steady 
amplitude, steady phase, sinusoids, or slowly changing. Then we convert voltages and currents into phasors. We represent capacitance and inductance with impedance and resistance as impedance. And then we, we work with complex numbers. And so that simplifies things because V equals IZ. Z looks like a resistance in Ohm's law. This looks like Ohm's law where the impedance of a capacitor is minus J, square root of negative one, minus J times one over omega C, okay? And one thing to take away from this is that the impedance of a capacitor falls with increasing frequency. And you can use that, you can use that characteristic to take noise out of circuits pretty easily. You can take noise off of power supply voltages with a big enough capacitor. If, if phasers or impedance doesn't fa sound familiar to you, or if, um, uh, if you want a refresher there, right? Check, check out the review videos that I posted. I have a whole, maybe five or 10 minutes on phasers and impedance. So take a look at that. Okay. Um, all right, so common types of capacitors. So getting away from the cartoon drawings and schematic symbols to real capacitors. So these are ceramic capacitors. Um, they're, they're small, they're cheap. They're usually small capacitance values, like, you know, you know maybe, maybe, maybe 10,000 picofarads, right? the largest down to nanofarads or picofarads. So peak, a few picofarads up to maybe, I don't know what the highest is, but 10,000 picofarads, definitely. You'll find these small ceramic caps. Um, they're non-polarized, so you can apply DC voltage either way. They're fine with that. There are electrolytic capacitors, and these are usually um, higher capacitance values. So you can have 4,700 microfarads in a reasonable size with an electrolytic capacitor. Um, so they're they're basically two. They're like a metal foil rolled up with an insulator. That's an, uh, this uh, electrolyte in there that, um, that forms the insulator. So, so you have, uh, uh, but they're, they're large tolerance and they have drift. So they might be 20% plus minus 20%, which sometimes that's good. Okay, you have mica capacitors. Oh, let me go back to the polarized of electrolytic. So you're going to be using electrolytic capacitors in, in lab. There's a band on one side. It either says minus or plus. Be sure that you connect minus to minus and plus to plus for the average DC voltage. Um, or else your capacitor might stop working. So mica capacitors are typically used in very high voltage applications or uh, low loss applications, for example, radio frequency, and they're typically small capacitance values. Um, and then there are variable capacitors, right? So a uh, variable capacitor looks like this. This is a big variable capacitor. Here's a circuit board mount, small variable capacitor. If you can see my camera, I should put Put the dock cam up. Here's a, I'll look at myself on the screen. Here's a capacitor that you see there. It has a knob on the end. You turn it and the, let's see if I can get this up there. The plates rotate. And all it's doing, it's the plates are interleaved. And as I rotate it, I'm, I'm making the plates parallel. Like if I, if I align the plates, like, I don't know if you can see that, they're all parallel. So that's the biggest capacitance. And if I totally slide the plates all the way out so that they're not overlapping at all, that's the minimum capacitance. So that's how those work. The one on the right is just a small version of the one on the left. Okay, so they're for tunable circuits. So when selecting capacitor, right, you're gonna consider the capacitance you need, the tolerance you need. Is it just a decoupling capacitor? We'll talk about that, just a big capacitor, or is it part of a tuned circuit? Is the, is the capacitor polarized? And what's the maximum voltage rating? Those are the, the big hitters in selecting a capacitor. <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's talk about a common application, which is um, uh, filtering noise um, from, uh, filtering noise off of a, a power supply line or a sensor line. Okay, so we're gonna talk about on this slide power filtering or signal filtering and, and blocking DC. So let's suppose you have 
a realistic source. We're going to talk about Thevenin equivalents. If you took my class, you've seen Thevenin equivalents. Most sources can be represented with a voltage source and a resistor in series. So this is just a source. It could be a battery. It could be a sensor. And then you have some DC load. So it's a DC source, DC load. The voltage should be constant or very slow lead time varying. And so you connect these two together, the source to the load, with test leads or jumper wires or circuit board traces or the, you know, the metal within the breadboard. And so uh, if there was nothing else in the universe, this would be fine. You'd have DC. And if everything were at absolute zero, you'd have nothing but DC. Uh, but the truth is that um, we have electromagnetic fields, fields in the environment. We have random motion of electrons in the environment, right? We have lots of things that cause noise. So a noise voltage appears on that wire. Wires, as I mentioned, have resistance. They also have inductance. They also have capacitance. But um, it's not a perfect. Wires are not a perfect conductor. So so you can induce uh, noise on them. There can be a voltage across them. All those little voltages add up to cause noise at your load. Okay. So that could be noise on, on power supply voltages. That's usually not good to have a very noisy power supply voltage applied to a chip, an integrated circuit that wants to see DC. Um, and if this is a sensor and you have some kind of data acquisition device on the other end, uh, then you have uh, you know noise on your signal. That's not good. So um, and noise on digital lines can cause errors in, in values. You can switch a one for a zero or a zero for a one. That's bad usually. Okay. So in comes the capacitor. When you use a capacitor like this, all I did, let me back up. All I did is I added a capacitor right here. And as I mentioned, capacitors for high frequencies look like low impedances. So this is a low impedance path to ground for high frequency noise or high frequency signals. Okay, so decoupling capacitors reduce noise from the external environment by providing a low impedance path to ground. Okay, so, so it's like, so I have DC here, and the DC component of the voltage won't go through the capacitor, right? It's, it charges up the capacitor, and, but that DC component does not, the current doesn't go through the capacitor, so it's okay, you can have a DC voltage across a capacitor. Impedance is infinite for DC, right? Um, but for noise, noise, which is AC, right, higher frequency noise, this will look like a very low impedance, essentially not quite a short to ground, but low impedance to ground. So that's what this is here over, over on the right. This is, if you look at this plot, uh, on the horizontal axis, this is frequency. It's a log scale in Hertz. On the vertical axis, I have magnitude of the impedance, right? Um, the magnitude means it's it's the ratio between voltage and current, not the phase. And you can see for reasonable values of capacitors, I can get very low impedance values. So here is here is one ohm, right? That's one ohm right there. A thousand microfarads will be one ohm, right? Just over a kilohertz, right? One microfarad, Capacitance will be one ohm, just over uh, what's that? 100 kilohertz, right? So you design your you design your uh, your capacitor. You choose your capacitor value based on what kind of noise you think you're going to have, what kind of inter interference you think you're going to have. Um, so we'll we'll uh, and you could do fancier things. You can use inductors in the filter, but but it's very common to uh, use capacitors at the power supply pin of almost every chip, every integrated circuit. Okay, so capacitors, in addition to filtering, they can also supply energy during transient loading. That means fluctuations in power consumption. So if you have, um, you know, a, a, an amplifier that turns on and off, a motor that turns on and off, motor controller maybe, you put, you put a, a capacitor such that when all of a sudden the current demand by the load changes, the capacitance can supply some of that energy right next to the load 
uh, instead of having to get high current through this wire that has resistance in it. Right? That's why, why you put capacitors right next to your load if you're trying to supply energy during transient events. Okay. And so capacitors are often used to pass AC and block DC. Okay, so you can you can couple an AC signal into a circuit and block all of the DC from the power supply if you want to do that. Okay, and as I mentioned, it's good practice, and you'll see this in your circuit for for the project. It's good practice to use decoupling capacitors near the power pins of of every IC and every electronics module, so you can get the noise out of the power supply. It might work without your capacitors. It might work, but you know, if you get some intermittent problems, you might have noise in your circuit. Okay, so here's your project schematic. And so you'll, you'll notice a lot of capacitors. And I see all of these capacitors in the circuit that are shown are used for decoupling. All of these capacitors are filtering noise out of what should be either a DC signal or a very slowly varying signal. Okay, so for example, like up here at, at um, let's see, I have one capacitor here at the RPM sensor, right? I have two capacitors here up at the DC motor because that DC motor actually itself is very noisy. So there are two capacitors because you saw how, um, you know, big capacitors look like low impedances at low frequencies, small capacitors look like low impedances at high frequencies. But what I didn't show you is actually small capacitors have, have some equivalent resistance, equivalent series resistance in them. So typically you have to use, uh, if you have a really noisy device, a small capacitor to filter out high frequencies and then a big capacitor to filter out low frequencies. And you put those side by side in parallel to ground so that you can take care of low and high frequencies. And so here's uh, here's an Arduino Uno schematic. So if you've worked with an Arduino Uno, this is the schematic for it. But if you you know pick through this, you'll see these capacitors. All the capacitors that I have circled are decoupling capacitors, right? They're there for a purpose. The company who designed and manufactured this would not put extra parts on them. They cost more, so they wind up being needed, right? These are all on DC voltages, and they're meant to take the AC noise out. Here's five volt power supply, right? Um, here's, uh, let's see, here's another, here's an analog reference that goes to ground. It's a DC supply or DC reference. Mm, here's another one down here. So that's what all those capacitors do. So a lot of capacitors in the circuits that you'll see are, are, are decoupling capacitors and their purpose is to remove unwanted AC noise, okay? And so, so here's a here's a measured example. Okay, I have I have a 10k output impedance and uh, for a sensor, and I have a 10k input impedance for a data logger, and I connect them together. Okay, so I'm just connecting a source, the sensor, to a load, the data logger, and and then I connected um, the data logger side to to an oscilloscope. Okay, and so you have I had this kind of noise, right? I, and I, and I, I didn't try to minimize noise of this test. I wanted to show you that, well, without a capacitor, you get some significant noise. And so this is a three volt DC. So here's ground here, that, that little arrow is where zero volts is. So you have a three volt DC-ish uh, sensor signal input into this data logger. And so what I did then is, well, and this is due to noise. So I have 77 millivolts of noise. A lot of noise. So then what I did is I connected a 0.1 microfarad capacitor right, right near the data logger. And I got this. So this is measured. Um, you'll see 3 volts DC and only 6 millivolts RMS of, of noise. OK, so just that one, you know, 1 cent, 3 cent, whatever capacitor. Um, made my measurements more accurate, re re removed the noise. That was a hardware solution. You could do it in software. This was a hardware solution for removing noise. So it resulted in a 92% reduction in noise voltage 
Okay. And a 99.4% re reduction in noise power because power is voltage squared. Okay. All right. So we talked about wires, we talked about wire gauge, we talked about um, a couple of practical examples, right, of high current through through wires and how voltage uh, voltage um, impacts that, why mechanical engineers might care, and then um, some good practices using capacitors in um, practical electronic circuits. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see here. So I saw someone has a question. How did you determine the noise? If if you would if you would hang around uh, for office hours because I hit the wall on time, and so I don't want to keep folks over. But please stick by, stick around for office hours if you want to chat or just listen in. You're welcome to do that. Check out Canvas for the upcoming assignments. Homework one is due this Friday. If you want to talk about that, stick around for office hours. Lab one will continue this week with uh, measurements. If you haven't done them or lockers if you want them, but please show up so that if I have any announcements, um, we can talk about those, and work out any details with the lab. Um, see the ITLL workshops that are coming up. If, if I get enough people who can't sign up for workshops and want workshops, we might be able to schedule a, a special session of workshops um, if that's needed. Check out the review videos if you want review on anything we talked about, capacitors, phasers, impedance. Um, and I will hold office hours right after class. So if you'd like to stick around, stick around. Um, if not, I will see you next time and have a great night.